What I'm going to present uh, today is uh, the um, design that we made uh, uh, for uh, the concrete plenum over uh, train tracks for fire safety, and for which we used uh, the performance-based fire engineering approach. Um, so uh, the way that uh, this presentation is organized is the following. I'm going to share with you the details of the structural system that we designed. Uh, but uh, I'm not, I, I will not be able to uh, share uh, the, can you still see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, but I will not be able to share uh, too many details that will allow you to locate the project itself because the project is confidential. Uh, so after introducing the target performance, I'm going to go over the three phases of performance-based fire engineering that we used in order to arrive to our uh, design uh, decisions. So this is a schematic uh, of the system that we analyzed. So the system is a six inches thick lightweight concrete one-way slab that is supported by uh, steel uh, tubes, uh, hangers, uh, hanging from uh, the main steel structure that supports buildings above. Uh, the uh, concrete plenum is interrupted roughly every 20 feet by openings, exhausts that allow the fumes and smoke coming out of the engines of the trains idling below it to actually be dissipated above the passenger platform. So uh, this is indeed the ceiling of a passenger uh, station. And uh, again, these uh, exhausts allow the smoke to be dissipated. This is a plan view of the station. Uh, on the west, on the east side, the station is open to the air, while on the west side is instead enclosed. Here, these red marks represent uh, the direction of those exhausts that uh, I uh, showed in the previous slide. And uh, this is also the direction of the tracks. I'm going to uh, refer uh, the tracks the closest to the open side as track A, and that closest to the closed side as track B. Uh, the plenum, as I mentioned before, is a one-way slab. So it's supported uh, um, uh, by uh, beams, uh, roughly um, every 25th. And uh, uh, the beams themselves are one foot uh, six inches wide in uh, section. So uh, in this case, uh, we were we had to adopt the performance-based fire engineering approach because uh, the authorities having jurisdiction over the station wanted to make sure that uh, the structural design for the replacement of the existing plenum was actually meeting their fire safety requirements that uh, required the plenum structural system to sustain fire loadings for at least one hour without collapsing. So uh, the fire scenario was actually already prescribed by the authorities having jurisdiction and uh, it was a fire, uh, a train fire occurring on one of the tracks, of the train tracks that run directly below the exhausts. So by virtue of this fire, uh, the bottom of the plenum would be exposed to flame impeachment and radiation from the flame, from the flame. Through the openings, uh, we would have hot gases coming into the space between the plenum and the steel girder above. And these uh, would create an increase, uh, a sensible increase in temperature at the top of the plenum and at the hangers. And then, of course, uh, the steel structure above would see uh, some increase in temperature, but uh, uh, it's protected by direct radiation from the flame from this five feet space that exists between uh, the top of the plenum and uh, the uh, steel girders underside. 
So as I already mentioned, the target performance for our fire safety design was that of confirming that the structural design was able, uh, uh, was achieving a structure that was able to sustain the prescribed fire loads for at least an hour without collapsing. And uh, uh, in analyzing our structure, what we did was using uh, the ASC 716 low combinations for extreme events. The ASC 716 was the code that was current at the time of design. And so here I am outlining what the, uh, what the low combination that we used for this uh, design was. So, 1.2 dead loads plus 50% of the live loads. So in order to apply the performance-based design approach, we followed three steps that roughly follow the same order of the chapters of the Manual of Practice number 138. So the first step is really a fire analysis, identifying what are fire scenarios that are reasonable for the structure that we are looking at and see what is their effect on the structural components. In this case, in this design, what we had were the prescriptions by the authorities having jurisdiction that identified as the maximum total heat release rate as 31 megawatt reached after 3180 seconds from the start of the fire and uh, uh, the fuel was a diesel fuel. Uh, we, for the configuration of the station, we identified the two fire scenarios that we believed were worth looking at. And uh, uh, the first fire scenario was uh, one uh, where the locomotive uh, in on fire would be on track A, that again was the one the closest to the open side uh, of the station. And fire scenario number two was one where the uh, fire would have occurred on track B that was instead the closest to the closed side of the station. In fire scenario one, what we expected to happen was to have a fire that was well fed by a constant oxygen supply and so that would have been able to burn for as long as the, uh, there was fuel to burn and so a long duration kind of fire. Uh, instead, on uh, for fire scenario two, what we expected to see and what we actually saw was uh, a, a fire that was more a compartment kind of fire uh, in between that space, that five feet space uh, uh, between the plenum and uh, the steel structure above. So in order to understand what were the uh, exposure temperatures uh, into the structural components that we were analyzing, we constructed a model in the fire dynamic simulator uh, by NIST and uh, simulated the two fire scenarios that I have just described. In the fire scene, in this model, so we added the uh, plenum with uh, its vents, uh, the hangers that here you don't see because they are covered by the simulation of the smoke, but the hangers were there, and also the steel above was modeled. Very important to mention that uh, uh, for the boundary conditions in terms of, uh, um, of the model, we had uh, that uh, on the east uh, front and back of the model domain, we used open vent that would have allowed that nice oxygen supply that feeds the fire. And for the top, bottom and west, um, boundaries, we instead use the closed vents option. Now, as the output from this fire analysis, we received uh, exposure temperatures. Uh, you see examples of these exposure temperatures uh, at the uh, top and bottom of the concrete plenum in a typical section, so in uh, like uh, far from the exhausts here on your left. And then we fed uh, these uh, uh, exposure temperatures into the finite element analysis model uh, developed by 
Professor Gernet uh, teams, uh, Safir, to identify the distribution of temperatures uh, within uh, the, uh, the, the this, either the slab or the beam. Here you see the temperature distribution obtained through uh, a heat transfer analysis in Safir uh, when the portion of the structural components that we are analyzing is that of the typical plenum. So uh, let's say within the exhausts. Uh, and uh, from these heat transfer analysis, what we get is uh, how the temperatures within the section of the analyzed structural components evolve uh, throughout the 60 minutes uh, of simulation that we needed to look at uh, in order to understand whether or not the authorities having jurisdiction target performance was met. Uh, here, instead, you see the same type of heat transfer analysis, but performed on the exhaust uh, uh, sides, so on the cantilever sides of both, of both slab and beam. And again, we uh, took the output from the fire analysis in FDS, we inputted it uh, into the uh, heat transfer analysis in SAFIR, and here in this case conservatively applied uh, this uh, temperature distribution bo both at the bottom and at the top of plenum and beam because uh, uh, in this case uh, we are operating uh, into regions that are directly above the fire, so uh, could be uh, actually uh, exposed to uh, dire flame impingement. Uh, for what concerns uh, the last component uh, we analyzed uh, was uh, the, the, the where the steel tubes. We produced uh, a 2D uh, section, a 2D model of the uh, of this uh, component, and again we used the uh, exposure temperatures uh, uh, received from the FDS model and inputted them into the SAFIR model to identify the temperature distribution within the rods. Now, the third step in performance-based fire engineering is that, uh, in performance-based fire design, really, uh, is that of using the temperatures distribution and associated uh, to them, uh, associate with them uh, a, a strength reduction factor uh, that in particular we used uh, the Euro code, the strength reduction factor to identify what was the capacity of these uh, various uh, structural members uh, at various interval of time under the fire loadings of the two fire scenarios that we uh, studied. And for the steel tubes in particular, we saw that when subject to, when exposed to the high temperatures of the fire, um, of the fire loading specified for this design, the, um, the original uh, uh, designed plate that was supporting uh, the uh, steel tubes, uh, well, that was connecting really the steel tubes to the concrete plenum, uh, was uh, uh, would have been uh, uh, fail uh, under higher temperatures. So this was our first design recommendation, adding an additional plate and a pair of stiffeners to each steel, uh, steel tubes next to the exhausts and adding fireproofing on the tube's surfaces exposed to uh, higher temperatures during the fire loads. So these were our first two uh, design recommendation. Uh, modifying the design, uh, the setup uh, of the steel tubes uh, to meet uh, the uh, target performance requirements. Then again, following uh, the same concept, so taking uh, the uh, temperature distribution from uh, the SAFIR model and then evaluating the capacity of the structural components using uh, uh, Eurocode strength reduction factors, we looked at the capacity of uh, here I'm showing, for example, the results for the cantilever plenum. And again, we noticed that while the 
uh, structural design for gravity loads would have worked uh, up to 45 minutes. Uh, in order to reach that 60 minutes target performance, uh, we had to uh, recommend uh, to increase the uh, concrete cover by 3 16 of an inch while uh, uh, the same kind of recommendation was not required for the uh, beams. Here you're, uh, I'm showing a schematic of the beam themselves. And here I'm showing that even for the cantilever portion of the beams, we had a satisfactory uh, demand capacity ratio, even at 60 minutes uh, after the fire starts. So, uh, for the beam design, we didn't have to recommend uh, anything uh, uh, in addition to what the original design was already there to do. Uh, so in our analysis, uh, we uh, relied on the presence of uh, our concrete cover. So in order to make sure that that concrete cover would have been there during the fire, we also uh, uh, well, prescribed to add a uh, polymer uh, into the concrete mix to really mitigate spalling and adding an additional one fourth of an inch to the slab thickness. In addition to the uh, re well, to the uh, in addition to the revision, not to the addition of another plate and another uh, pair of stiffeners uh, to the bottom of the uh, steel tube hangers. So this uh, completes my presentation. I'm three minutes late, but if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Roshana. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. I actually had a comment on, on slide number 13, where you were showing the steel tubes uh, modeled in 2D, plane mm -hmm. modeling, actually. Uh, we made that error at CSTV and some of our colleagues in the anchoring world did model anchors in 2D. And uh, the problem with that is that you are not representative of the temperature profiles that you get in the anchor rods when you do it. So mm -hmm. it's not hotter, it's not cooler, it's just more diffusive due to the excess of steel quantity in the third unmodeled dimension. So I just wanted to make this comment and it, it will probably have uh, repercussions on on point four of your conclusions um, on like what you're saying is that you uh, you see the need of a 3D model rather than a 2D. Well, model. if it's possible in axis symmetry, it would be simpler, of course, less expensive. But yeah, sometimes for complex geometries of of anchor groups and stuff like that, you need to do a 3D model. We, in this case, though, we were being uh, quite conservative in the application of uh, uh, the fire loading, uh, as we knew that we were made, we were making a simplification in the modeling itself. And we were using, so we were actually using uh, uh, the temperatures that we were getting from the fire model, and we were applying them uh, like uh, uh, at the top of the anger. Uh, using the fire model temperatures that we were using. And then uh, along the, tubi the tubes um, bases themselves, we were using an average between the bottom and the top. So we were overall uh, uh, giving uh, uh, higher temperatures that like every point would have seen. And we ended up uh, uh, again not to... Well, I, I understand in consideration, how you... Yeah, keeping in consideration what we, um, the simplifications in the model that we made, we also added the fireproofing. But uh, yeah, definitely 3D analysis uh, in this case. Uh, um, I, I take your suggestion, of course. Yeah, because in, in the third unmodeled dimension, it's like an infinite plate. So actually it carries more heat into, into your concrete member. And uh, yeah, it's a case by case. Uh, you cannot say it's more. Well, but in this case, would have not be like though. This is a steel yes. cube. Yeah, it's not an infinite. Uh, uh, that there is not. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. it's a steel, a vertical steel tube. So the, the the third direction is really just uh, the diameter seen on the other side. 